So hello everybody and thank you for joining the channel. And with me, I have the creative director of Intercept Games, Nate Simpson. Welcome, Nate. Howdy, nice to see you. Nice to have you. Uh, I have uh, talked briefly with Nate to where we, I would have a couple of questions for him, both regarding the reception of For Science. So Nate, basically, we had the KSP2 for science well over a month or even not close, coming on to two months. So, and I see the overall reception has been positive. How's the team feeling about the feedback received from the community? Uh, well, obviously very positive. Um, you know, I, I think uh, there's always a lot of work to do on the project and especially heading into the DOT2 for science update the, the, one of the biggest challenges was figuring out which tasks deserve priority, right? We, we, we needed to come up with a, a, a package that would sort of add up to something that felt like a significant step forward, especially because over the course of the year, many of the updates that we issued felt very incremental. So, um, yeah, I mean, there was, there was quite a lot of discussion around what are the meaningful changes that we should bring in that because we can't do everything right what we we have a very long list of things we want to bring to the game but we can't do them all at the same time we have to pick which ones to do first um and yeah so so we, what we ended up with we ended up with like three kind of main things that we wanted to bring with that update one of them was to turn it from a toy into a game and that that came with the bringing in this new game mode on top of uh, on top of sandbox bringing in science mode where you can progress you know through a tech tree and collect science and do missions all, and that was sort of what turned it into a game with with sort of interesting goals to pursue but there was a lot of other stuff we needed to bring too we needed to complete the core game loop we didn't have re-entry heat at that time we didn't uh, buoyancy was pretty broken obviously we had the wobbly rockets thing that we had to address yeah so that one yeah, was just nasty. figuring out it was nasty. Yeah, it was really challenging to fly anything really before that update. So um, in retrospect, it may seem like it was an easy call, but uh, I, I think we we made the right call and we picked the right things to to prioritize. And yeah, it, it ultimately resulted in a lot more playing people playing the game. Uh, you know, I talk a lot about how we like to go on Discord and, and check out people's screenshots and, you know, Reddit, people talking about the things they're achieving. And, you know, just people think that are, are enjoying the framing of the missions. They're, they're finding them funny and interesting and in some cases very challenging, which is kind of what we wanted. We wanted a range of experiences, some of which would be a little more approachable and some of which would really kind of test your abilities. And yeah, to, to see that that is resulting in a lot of people having fun, I think was kind of our, our main goal. And, that, and I think we achieved that. I definitely couldn't agree more. I mean, from my personal side, I know that uh, before the For Science update, I was having a hard time picking up and actually playing it, despite the fact that I really love KSP and I love the aesthetic of KSP too. And But at some point it was just becoming really hard for me to do some things, but... I realized also after the For Science update, I couldn't stop playing it because it was fun. I had, there was now a progression. There was a game loop that was driving me forward. And there was, for me, I'm always uh, on my channel. I have been doing now, like I think five Let's Play series of KSP1. And really for me, it was about the progression, unlocking the next big thing. And I like the incremental delivery of things. So definitely agree with you there. And there's also, I think, maybe something to the idea that we are all going through those missions together as a community, too. Like, it's fun to hear people compare their experiences with, I don't know, Capybara Rock or, you know, or, or further down, you know, you know, I don't want to get into spoiler territory, but some of the later missions are brutally difficult. And it's and it's pretty, pretty interesting to see how people are solving some of those challenges as well. For me, uh, getting that... Uh... Point. I think it was a Capybara rock is still an issue. I designed a space plane or actually half space plane to get there. I managed to get so close and then I failed at the literally last oh, no. hundred meters. So oh, what did you, you, you weren't able to get inside the hundred meter radius? Like there was a crash with the plane. No, I actually ran out of, I ran out of juice going upwards. Oh. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah. All right. But I'm still working on it. So it will come. <laughs> So yeah, we'll let's uh, let's get to the second one. Uh, and uh, you mentioned that the 
the, you mentioned you changed the feature team structure, the feature team structure for the for science. So now, basically, two months after the further down the line, how has impacted this your daily flow, ability to deliver estimates? Uh, did anything change since the for science release? Yeah, I, I think as as you might have guessed, um, especially once we're in early access, there's definitely a sense that that there's an external pressure to deliver, right? That we know that the fans want more features, and and obviously there are still some bugs that we want to correct, that sort of thing. And it's very easy to slip into a mode of always rushing and always seeing everything as being equally uh, uh, an equal emergency, like and which gets you in this kind of mode of like, we got to fix everything all at once, which ironically makes you slower. Mm. Um, I know the feeling. So, 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 so beginning to build processes, some systemic processes that allow us to uh, take a step back and assess how a feature fits in with a larger constellation of features and measure what value that feature brings versus all the other features that we want to be working on. And then what the feature teams has brought is um, accountability, uh, a sense of ownership for the people who are in those individual teams that they, they often have the best solution to a given problem because they are working with the relevant systems. So having it be less top down and more of a, of a flat structure where anyone in the room can bring a good idea um that's definitely helped um we have what's changed uh we've added a couple feature teams like the process is working well enough that we're beginning to break it up into slightly more specialized groups um yeah and and i think probably we're doing a better job now of making sure that all expectations are aligned at the beginning of feature development so that there are fewer surprises toward the end right so uh, just making sure that everyone all up and down the chain is seeing the same hologram in their heads when they embark on the work so that we don't end up in a situation to two thirds of the way through the feature where we're like, well, I thought it was going to be this way. And you thought it was going to be that way, um, which I think, again, all boils down to learning how to measure twice and cut once instead yeah. of cutting like eight times. <laughs> yeah, I had uh, one. Uh friend from a YouTuber community who has basically measured twice, cut once, bulldoze everything. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm, I'm glad to hear that's not the case here, but uh, <laughs> he's, he's actually he's actually quite a funny guy, but uh, definitely sounds like that and always taking a step back to see how an item fits into the grander basically vision is definitely a good call to make, even though if it takes a little bit extra. I mean, I think in the end, it feels like it takes extra, but it actually creates less work in the long run because yes. you're not redoing work. And mm -hmm. I think that's, it's ironically, I hate to say this, it's a little bit the opposite of the way I like to play Kerbal, right? The whole, the whole joy for me of Kerbal is like, first thought, best thought, slap it together, let's see how it goes. Um, but when you're trying to run an efficient creative enterprise, I hate to admit, sometimes you actually have to do some real planning <laughs> right at the beginning. <laughs> yeah. uh, I hear you. Yeah, basically, uh, I can understand that. I, for for once, I'm basically always designing a craft backwards, basically, starting what I'm returning mm -hmm. and then trying to plan it as I go. But usually, for, from a content creator perspective, it gets fun when you mess it up. So yep. that those are the best parts. But I, I, I hear you when it comes to development, it's a whole different ball game. All right, uh, speaking for science, uh, for science has introduced some, you know, experiments that take a while to complete. For example, being atmospheric survey, I cannot tell you how many times or how I need I needed to complete that one. And actually, I like the fact that it takes so longer. But uh, my question is basically: Are you going to take those? You know, in the upcoming experiments, I do expect that there will be more experiments with the, you know, colonies, expansions, and all that jazz. But will you be taking it a little bit to extreme? Maybe like experiments that would take days, months to complete even? Um, so all the options are on the table. Uh, I can say that. Um, and we definitely don't want the experiments to feel too similar to one another. I mean, obviously we had a bug up, uh, up to 2.1 where uh, you, would, you would lose your progress on a science experiment when you cross between two science regions. Uh, and so obviously the thing you described wouldn't have worked until 2.1, but now, now we've sorted that out, fortunately. Um, 
So, yes. Number one, uh, colonies will definitely be bringing new kinds of gameplay, including new kinds of science collection. That is a part of the long-term strategy for colonies. I have a lot of, we actually, um, we have already built the assets for a range of space telescopes. I've talked about that in other interviews. Um, and I, I'm very excited about the future potential for those parts. But uh, again, having to sort of balance the completion of those systems against uh, the completion of other features. Um, but that's definitely on our radar as something that we eventually want to be able to pursue. And I love the idea of doing something like uh, a Hubble deep field, uh, you know, star survey. Uh, like that sounds to me like that would be a really interesting uh, sort of long exposure science undertaking. Um, mm -hmm. And I think there are a lot of things that kind of fall in that category that become more possible once we have colonies. So yeah, watch that space. I think there are a, a lot of opportunities there. Yeah, one of my actually very favorite mods from the KSP1 was, I don't know if you have seen the Hubble, because and if you pair that one with the orbital telescopes mode, you could able, able to point your telescope to a certain area and then zoom it out until you could get, for example, like a picture of Minmus and these kind of things. So sound just hearing you say talking about the telescopes, that sounds great. Yeah, it's it's very, again, this will be something you hear me say a lot, which is we have a very big appetite. And a big part of, uh, you know, if, if, if you would say we're evolving an organization as an organization, we're getting better at not attempting to do everything at the same time. So I frequently have to ma balance my impulses as a fan because I am also a Kerbal fan and I want all of the treats right now. Um, I have to always couch these things in terms of, OK, uh, we got to do some other stuff first, but that is definitely on the map. Right. Um, basically, when we're speaking about the experiments, I seen that in for science you have add, added an orbital lab that which reminds me of one of my favorite KSP one mods called Station Science, that gives a, basically requires a resupply mission of some resources for some more advanced experiments. I don't know how much familiar you are with the Station Science, for example, like a kibble required for creature comforts. In essence, it gives orbital laboratories a purpose, for example, like for the real, you know, for the International Space Station, like. Do you have something like that in plans for the KSP, at least to your knowledge? So uh, I'd say the closest thing to that kind of gameplay is what we anticipate we'll be seeing uh, when Colonies becomes a mature feature. Uh, because uh, really, to me, one of the most exciting things about a colony once we also have the resource system, which we may talk about a little bit later, um, and once we have delivery routes, which which is a system within which uh, you are able to fly a mission carrying a resource from one place to a colony or from a colony to another colony. Um, and then when you arrive at the destination, automate that route. Essentially, the vehicle then stops being physical and it becomes a timer. At that time, like uh, on a periodicity dictated by the amount of time it took you to do the initial the initial mission within the delivery route system, you would then have that resource being debited and credited on a timeline in perpetuity until you decide to retrieve the vehicle from the delivery route and make it just a physical vehicle again, which you will be able to do. So um, once you have that ability and you have extractable resources across multiple celestial bodies in multiple star systems, and we have unique resources that in some cases can only be found in a particular location on a particular celestial body, and some of those resources may gate your access to a very specific kind of propulsion technology or some other really interesting kind of part. That is, uh, if I'm being honest, maybe the thing I'm most excited about in, in the medium to long term for KSP2, because then you are building a, essentially an interstellar um, delivery infrastructure where you can be moving resources from their points of collection to, to ground colonies and then from those ground colonies to orbital colonies and even have a big giant orbital colony somewhere that is centrally located to which all of your delivery routes are sending supplies. Um, and then you are able to make any kind of vehicle at that location. That becomes your kind of super base. I'm Basically, so excited about that. 
basically like uh, in for all mankind. I don't know if, you know if you're selling last season, capturing the Goldilocks or trying uh, to I, capture I, one. I fell off the, the for all mankind wagon, I think near the end of season two, but I've heard season four is pretty great. So I, I am planning on season four is good. You should check it out at some point. Yeah. So you, it's interesting how uh, being a Kerbal fan affects your ability to enjoy science fiction of any kind. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I think it was when the two, when the, when the Pathfinder shuttle passed the other shuttle behind the moon and they were moving slow enough relative to one another that they could like see each other's faces. And I was like, oh man, don't do this to me. No, yeah, I remember I, that was the moment where I said, okay, you know, literally, come on, seriously. All I right. mean, every uh, once in a while, they really dig into the science in ways that are pretty exciting, especially in season one, you know, when Sea Dragon appeared at the very end, I was like, oh, yeah, these guys get it. I want I can't wait. And then, yeah, I hope I hope we see more stuff like that. Absolutely. Um, all right. Uh, now, back into KSP1 R&D, and I know that I'm a little bit sucker for KSP1. There was a popular feature. I don't know how many people use it. I'm probably the only sucker that's going there, ch checking my progression, but it was called Archive. And that's where you show where did you get the science from and more importantly, where you didn't yet. So is that feature going to come back in KSP2 in some sort of way where we could see which biomes did we get, what science did we get, et cetera? Yeah, that, that is on our list. Of, first of all, you're not the only person <laughs> who wants it. Um, I want it. Any of us who are testing the game with any frequency, it, it would be really nice to know how close you are to "quote unquote" done uh, with each with each celestial body. It's definitely something that we're pursuing. I can't speak to timing right now, but uh, there are specs for this. Uh, it's not expected to work the same way as the archive in KSP one. Um, uh, we think we have a, a pretty elegant solution for it, but yeah, um, it is definitely something that we want to do. All right. That sounds good to me. Uh, now, talking about a little bit the communications network, I'm a big sucker for, you know, remote tech. Comnet, I do like, it, but I'm, I'm kind of a bigger fan because of, you know, signal delay, but obviously we're going to stellar, it's gonna go haywire completely. But uh, question is, Comnet, in my opinion, obviously, is a little bit of afterthought, and it, which is understandable because it's all early stages. For example, signal passes through planetary bodies. I'm not sure if that's a bug or that's intended for the gamification. And it doesn't depend, for example, on electric charge. I could be wrong there. I have observed that. Not sure. Uh, but do you have any thoughts in terms of expanding the communications gameplay further to, you know, just be on the comnet level? Or will there be, you know, remote tech levels, maybe signal delay, flight computers, or were you happy with just where it is at the moment? It's a good question. So I'm probably gonna sound a little bit like a broken record here. Um, this often, uh, these questions often come down to that question of priority, right? Of course. That anytime we look at a feature, let's, let's take ComNet as the feature. What we're saying when we say, let's bring ComNet up to KSP1 parity with line of sight and all that stuff. Um, we are also saying we are not going to deliver some other feature until later. Right. If we get that feature, we don't get some other feature. Of course. And especially because this is a team, first and foremost, of KSP fans, right? With many former modders. We have many, many big fans of KSP one. And we all have parts of that game that we love the most. Mm -hmm. And we all play and as just like any any uh random selection of KSP fans, we all played the game differently from one another. Absolutely. And so, I, I mean, I remember the meeting where we were talking about ComNet. Like, what is ComNet going to mean in the earliest phases of KSP1? And there being a lot of passion in the room, right? But some people just really love that detailed, highly simulated ComNet gameplay. And I think in the end, what we determined was we needed it to meet some basic requirements in, that, in order to unblock core gameplay, right? Just to, just to get to that minimum bar of realism. With the expectation, we call that MVP, the, the mm -hmm. most valuable version of that, uh, or sorry, the minimum viable product. Minimum viable product, it. yeah. Minimum viable product for, for a feature. Uh, I also, I, li I like most, most valuable. <laughs> I guess I'm stuck in basketball mode. I don't know what happened there. Um, 
And so uh, we have to constantly be running everything through that MVP filter, right? Because right. To, to, to quote Ender's game, uh, the enemy's gate is down. Like we yeah. need to get to colonies. We need to get to interstellar. We've got a lot of big stuff, resources, resource extraction and delivery routes and all the stuff we just Obviously. talked about. That is going to fundamentally alter the gameplay. That is going to make this mm -hmm. game into a game that is unlike anything any of us have ever played before. Absolutely. And so anytime that we're talking about any feature of any kind, yeah, we are have always to having to balance. And, and there is always a balance, right? There, it's not like sure. we can just stop delivering things. We Absolutely. still do need short-term goals. We need big and small goals. But mm -hmm. we always need to make sure that they are... Uh, that we're aimed toward that larger goal of delivering these these features that I think are really going to just radically change the experience. Um, Absolutely. And, and, and besides, we, if, yeah. there are modders and obviously modders will mod. So that's definitely another way where KSP Remote Tech 3 or 4 might actually get in. Who knows? And and that is a really, a really good point. I, I think if KSP1 showed the way, which I think it did, um, this is a long tail project. We'll continue to bring new functionality to this game for years, but there is also uh, there's also the modders where if people don't uh, don't want to wait for something like that, they they are absolutely free to pursue it. And one of just to go back to your original question about the how we're feeling about the dot two release, uh, seeing modding uh, take a significant uptick, a real spike in modding activity after that update again, was a clear sign to us that the community is healthy and excited. Um, so yeah, so eventually, if the modders don't get to it, I would love to be able to revisit combat is the short answer. Well, sounds sounds awesome. And to be perfectly frank, after the, uh, after I'm in KSP1, I'm playing with tons of mods. I'm talking log in the hundreds range. But uh, KSP2, since the For Science release, actually, I was been playing vanilla and I surprised myself. I was actually, until then, I was doing heavy mods, basically my, you know, gameplay fixes, you know, the engineer, so to say, one of my favorite mm -hmm. mods of all time. But with those things fixed, I'm actually played a little bit vanilla because I want first to go finish up the progression and then maybe just, you know, jump into the modding and see what is there on offer. But uh, I, I understand and your answer is, right on the ball here and i think you're delivering much bigger experience and it makes sense once we are start seeing those things definitely right uh now question about a little bit to the performance obviously when we're talking about ksp2 we've seen some pretty i would say drastical performance in fps at least ksp2 for science update uh, do you have any more you know larger uh, performance updates in the pipe, or will it be smaller incremental upgrades that we should be on the lookout for? Um, I, a lot of that is contingent on your definition of large and incremental. Um, so th there are many components to, to this question, right? One of our stated very large goals is to uh, reduce the min spec requirements for the game. We would like more people mm -hmm. to be able to play the game on their machines. So we are always looking for opportunities to improve the performance. Um, and uh, you probably would want to be talking to, to an engineer on the team to get a detailed answer to how it is that we're pursuing performance improvements. We also have upcoming features that are going to increase the performance burden, namely colonies and interstellar class vehicles. Um, things are going to get bigger. Uh, they're gonna, you're going to start seeing some much higher, higher part counts. And so we are all also always in the business of balancing uh, new feature requirements uh, against the need to maintain a minimum bar of performance. That so sometimes yeah. it's a little bit, you know, uh, two steps forward, one step back, right? We're, we, we, we're clawing back these performance improvements and then we kind of soak up the difference with new functionality. Um, so it's a battle, it's an ongoing battle. Uh, and yes, you will see some performance improvements um, but I, I think it would be very difficult for me to uh, really speak in detail about the exact of magnitude of the, those performance improvements. Sometimes we surprise ourselves. Um, you know, obviously the Unity engine does uh, offer a lot of interesting things via the job system and the birth compiler. Um, and, you know, the sort of potential to parallelize more processes 
Uh, and so, you know, we're constantly finding new opportunities to multi-thread things. Uh, and yeah, that th we have not come close to, you know, fully utilizing um, all of the capabilities that the engine provides. So yeah, we'll continue to see improvement over time, I think. Well, that in itself is a pretty reassuring thought, I would say. Now, when we are talking, uh, as we are talking, the next update uh, was the 0.2.1.0 has released. Uh, but depending on the reception, did you have any more updates planned before the colonies? Or is the next one that we should be looking at the colonies update? Nope. More, more updates before colonies, for sure. OK. Sounds good. Uh, one uh, of the highly requested features that we have at the moment is the precision maneuver uh, tool. So what can you basically, uh, it, because currently it's kind of hard to make those interplanetary maneuver nodes fiddling, moving them around a little bit. So do you have any comments in terms of something like that? And maybe even when? It's uh, so you'll never get a win out of me. I used to give All wins right. in the old days and boy, did I get in trouble for that because my <laughs> wins are always wrong. Um, <laughs> if, unless I'm saying something is coming out in the next month or so, never mm. trust my estimates. I'm yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm always a little more optimistic than reality is able to, to provide. Um, but uh, yes, uh, absolutely a very high priority. Uh, both outside of and inside of the team. Uh, it is probably the single most requested piece of functionality just from other people on the team. Um, because again, we play the game a lot and this is, uh, it's it's super challenging and it's only gonna get more challenging when interstellar maneuvering is a thing as well. Uh, so yeah, uh, yes, it is a priority. Mm -hmm. Okay, but one more question when it comes to this uh, maneuver tool. I know in KSP1 at one of those literally lost features that the devs added was one of the, where basically a KSP would plot uh, sort of like an ejection maneuver for you. Uh, will there be anything like that? To your knowledge, I'm not asking when, I'm just thinking in general, or I know that we have... Uh, so like I said, it, it was the last edit to KSP1. Is that something on the roadmap or is it more like along the fine maneuver nodes tool? Yeah, I, so I haven't looked uh, at, in detail at the current plan for the fine maneuver node controls. Um, I have a, a high level understanding of what they will include, um, but I don't know that I could speak. Like you're, you're talking about like ejection angle planning, like yeah. sort of some of the, the so in addition to phase angles, also looking for where in your orbit at the source planet you would be when you're departing. Um, yeah, I think like draw me a maneuver, you know? Yeah, sort of. I I, uh, I don't know the answer to that immediately. Certainly not in the very short term. So uh, basically the same question when it comes to alarm clock. Do you know if it's something like that on the roadmap? I know that you have basically the trigger AU, so you have to ask. <laughs> So uh, yes, so as you said, David Trigoning, AKA Trigger AU, is the creator of the Kerbal Alarm Clock mod in KSP1. So you would not be surprised to hear that this is uh, a priority for him, uh, but it's also something that we hear a lot about from fans. Yeah, I think that's gonna have to still go in that bucket of, yes, we want it, open question about timing, um, sure. I think we'll probably get precision maneuver planning before we get that sort of functionality. Um, but also we're constantly uh, tracking how the community uh, is feeling about the current feature set and what areas of gameplay are, you know, causing them frustration or the ones that they're most excited about. Um, so this is a really good example of an item to, uh, you know, vote, vote with your comments. Um, if 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 we hear a, an upwelling of support about any given feature, that does factor into those conversations we're having about priority, right? I mean, it, uh, I will be entirely honest in saying that the groundswell of Wobbly Rockets frustration that was created when Matt Lown posted his Wobbly Rockets video was a thing that was talked about in the meeting when we were determining the priority for of coming to a solution for Wobbly Rockets. And it doesn't mean that it's entirely the reason why that we why we did it, but it certainly is a thing that comes up in meetings. We we will say we have seen on Reddit or we have seen in the forum that people are frustrated about this or that experience. 
maybe we should give this a little a little more of our time. Okay, so talking a little bit more about the colonies, I actually noticed that the first colony is already in the game, and that's Kerbal Space Center on Kerbin. If you go into Very the tracking good. station under colonies, you will actually see it. And uh, from what I understand, uh, colonies will change fundamentally the way we access space. And I actually made that episode, like, I think a couple of weeks ago, where I actually tried to explain with, like, launching to do a mission from Menmus. But uh, uh, my question is, when it comes to colonies, will they be placeable anywhere we choose? Or will we have a predefined spots where we can build them? Anywhere you choose. And, and honestly, like, a big part of the excitement to me, uh, the, the part of that system that I think I'm going to be having the most fun with, and, and I've actually talked in interviews about having had this experience while playing prototype versions of colonies with NKSP2 locally. Um, building a colony in the quote unquote wrong spot is actually a lot more fun. Oh yeah. <laughs> uh, I, I, can... I, I really like the idea of building, you know, uh, off of certain unique geological formations like discoverables. Some of the discoverables are quite strange, strangely shaped. And every time a new discoverable comes around, almost the first question I have is, how would I turn this into the, the basis of a colony? How would I build a colony on, under, or around this thing to make it kind of an interesting, I don't know. Yeah, I'm, I'm, uh, there's a sort of Frank Lloyd Wright impulse to integrate these colonies into the landscape in a way that, that uh, makes them unique. I'm very excited about that. Matt Lowne's video of hanging colony from the monarch in KSP one in KSP yes. one comes to mind, definitely. Yeah, exactly. Question when it comes to um, uh, the colonies as well. Will we be, I mean, I know that the resource system isn't yet in the game and it's planned for a much later release. So I'm assuming when it comes to building colonies, they will be assets that you can actually, you know, create, build, but you will, they will not be requiring resources or? That is correct with an asterisk. Uh, so, yes, the first version of colonies will not be gated by local availability of uh, resources because the resource system, as you said, is coming a little bit later. Um, but we we did see the need for the colony experience to, to be uh, whole, to be an interesting experience before the arrival of those resources. And we have an approach that we are uh, pretty excited about. And I can say no more about it in this in this moment. But um, yeah, we, we believe colony gameplay will be engrossing uh, from its inception, but it will evolve as those resources and delivery routes do come online. Uh, you'll you'll start to see actually many aspects of the colony gameplay experience become uh, more diverse and more interesting uh, over time. Do you know, uh, and I'm just basically fishing for part counts, do you know, have any idea how many new parts are we talking about in the Colonies update? I haven't counted them, um, and I should have. <laughs> uh, mm. Well, part of the reason I can't count them is that there are still quite a few parts being completed right now. So, uh, and all of those parts are only really complete after they have gone through a full round of testing and QA has had their way with them and we have guaranteed that they enhance the gameplay experience and don't break anything. Um, so uh, so I can't give you a number, but I mean, just to give you a, a, a notion, it's it's dozens of it's dozens of parts. It's not it's not a small list. All right. So, sounds interesting. That we'll definitely have our hands full with that then. Yeah. Uh, so when talking about colonies, you also talked about automation and you did touch on this point a little bit, ability to set up delivery routes. Is that coming within the colonies or will it be coming further down the line? That's down the line. That That is that is meant to support the resource extraction, okay. uh, storage and synthesis. That, that uh, yeah, as I said before, um, that's sort of a package deal. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think to bring in uh, I might be talking a little bit out of school here, but to, to bring resources and the resource requirement for colony expansion without bringing delivery routes would turn colonies into an extremely grindy experience. Having to manually bring every, literally manually dig every resource out of the ground and then transport it to the colony. I'm sure there is a kind of player who would be very excited about that but uh, but one of the standards we're trying to hold ourselves to across the entire game is we don't want to ask the player to do the same thing twice. We don't, we don't think that's an engrossing gameplay experience. 
And in many cases, we will be situating a resource in a very awkward location. And it will require a certain amount of sort of problem solving to figure just how to figure out how to get it once. But, but once you've gotten it out and, you know, and maybe contingent also on how efficient you've been in getting it out, right? That since we're talking about delivery routes functioning on a timer, then the larger the vehicle is that, that is associated with extracting that resource, then the bigger of a delivery you'll get each time the delivery is re-upped. Oh, so there are, some, there are some reasons to, to try to carry more uh, with each mm -hmm. of your trips. Yeah, it's um, like with the train to have a bigger train delivering stuff rather than just two wagons. Yeah, definitely. Exactly right. Um, so, so uh, I've already forgotten the original question, but uh, oh, delivery routes. Yeah. So, so definitely later, uh, and definitely a necessary part of colony resource gameplay, in my opinion. Okay, sounds good. Uh, then when it comes. Uh... I have basically just, I believe, two more questions. One is actually if uh, you could be commenting uh, in more detail about your picture that you have posted for the one year anniversary update that you said, oh, if only you could see these parts in rotation. So I don't know if you uh, so, recall the picture. So if you could so, comment a little bit more. I, I, I definitely can comment on the picture. Um... So it was built by uh, an, an artist who was just testing their parts in, in game to be sure that they were lighting and animating correctly. Um, and uh, there's a lot of stuff that passes through our company Slack that, that is, you know, variously exciting. And so uh, our artist, Jonathan Cooper, who, was, who, who took the footage of that, he actually set it to some beautiful classical music. Sometimes he attaches music to his, his test clips just to get people in the mood. And it definitely gave a very 2001 feeling to me, you know, the turning have, have modules and, uh, and seeing the flywheels on each have module spinning in the opposite direction and, and all the love and care that, uh, that the parts team and Chris Adderley in particular have been pouring into, um, into that. Um, I, I didn't build the colony. Uh, and so I don't know how good it is. <laughs> um, and I think it was mostly meant to have a mixture of parts on it just so that you could see how they were all working together in in uh, uh, in concert. But yeah, I, I saw some like, I don't know, it was maybe on Reddit or, or Discord, people really trying to pick it apart. I know some people detected some radiators. That was correct. Those are radiators. Um, and thermal management is an expected part of colony gameplay. Um, so yeah, uh, I don't know if I could go into much more detail than that. That sounds all awesome. All right, now I have two very difficult technical questions because I've been struggling with those. And one is in the VAB, what is the difference between the craft and the workspace? And probably I'm sounding like a total dum dum here, but when I'm saving, I'm saving both at the same time. So I'm just trying to get basically, you know, straight from the dev's mouth, the distinction between the two. Okay. Uh, this is mostly my fault. Uh, the, the the failure to communicate <laughs> the intent around these systems uh, is something that uh, frustrates me personally. And I, I do think that there are probably some future UX and or UI improvements that will make a little clearer what our uh, ultimate goal was for these systems. But very broadly, a workspace file is a collection of subassemblies that lives inside the VAB. And one of those uh, subassemblies is the launch subassembly, which is the actual vehicle itself. And you can, as you know, designate any of those subassemblies as the launch assembly, and that launch assembly becomes the craft. Mm -hmm. um, the intent was that the vehicle name would be something like Apollo, right? Mm -hmm. I have named my program. I have named, I've given it some nice, simple, proper name that is the name that I want to see refer to the vehicle when it's in flight, when I'm looking at it in the map view. Oh, there goes Apollo. Great. And I don't want my Apollo module to be called uh, Apollo underscore 04 underscore 2023 February 18th A, right? Which is how I tend to name my workspace files because with workspaces, I'm constantly making minor adjustments and constantly improving things. <laughs> Excuse me. 
So the idea was that the workspace was meant to be like your uh, your work file, the, the your internal file that you're using for developing the idea. And the name was just supposed to be the proper name that you wanted it to be referred Call by. Call sign almost. Call sign almost. But because okay. they both appear inside the save interface right on top of one another, there's no sense of hierarchy or distinction. So people yeah. generally just end up typing the same thing into both of them. <laughs> okay, I was so, under impression. I was under impression that basically workspace would be like Minmus and then a Minmus suite of Croft. And so it was like more folder file. But uh, I guess uh, th this, uh, this actually makes sense when it comes from a gameplay perspective. Yeah. It's, it is, I, I think probably, I mean, you could tell me if this makes sense, but my gut is telling me that if we just move the name out of the saving dialogue entirely and just put the name at the top of the BAB, just be like, just, mm. just, just name your thing, just kind of like in KSP1. And then, and then, you know, file name management, that kind of thing, I think does belong inside the save dialogue. Well, I don't maybe know. we'll find out, uh, maybe I will find out in the comments of this video. See what, uh, yeah, see what other people have to say. I'll read the comments and we'll we'll see <laughs> what people think. Uh, okay, and uh, the final question that I have for you was in terms of asparagus staging. I'm a big fan of asparagus staging, and I've recently, basically, when I was trying to do asparagus staging craft, I noticed that for some reason I couldn't, and it was mainly, I think, uh, due to the ability to split the. Uh, was it uh, engines when they fire at the same stage or something like that? I'm pretty sure there's going to be a video tomorrow that will be showing me how, how you can do it, but I'm just curious. Yeah, so so the way that symmetry groups work right now in KSP2, they're pretty, excuse me, pretty rigid, um, and, and, and it's very hard to create like subdivisions within those groups. So, you know, if you have a six booster asparagus configuration, Currently, the way I do it is just to p put it in 2x symmetry and mm. turn on snap mode and just place three pairs mm. so that then I can then I can run the fuel lines around it and not see weird duplication of fuel lines all over the place. Yeah, um, that makes sense. That is a really good example of a thing that almost like Comnet, right? It works right now, but it creates an inconvenience. You can sort of work around it. I've, I've seen a lot of people work around it, but it's a little bit annoying. Um, and then once again, we have to have that conversation about, well, we can uh, overhaul the way symmetry groups work, uh, which I think in the long term is a thing we will probably need to do. Um, I'd but say is it good enough for probably. now? Yes. Yeah, I, I, I don't know that I, that is always an open question and we're constantly discussing that sort of thing. Yeah, you're right. I'm so so much set in my own ways when I'm designing a craft. So I actually going three two way symmetries, and I've already done those a couple of times, but uh, you know, never occurred to me. And it's not it's not perfect, right? Because you want to be able to. I mean, when you do it that way, then you sometimes have minor vertical discrepancies in in the boosters. It is not a perfect solution. Uh, and and yeah, it sure is a, a fun it, one. These though. little. It's this sort of stuff that keeps me awake at night, by the way. Like it's you wake up at 3 a.m. and you're like, God, just just the, you know, the symmetry behavior, put it on the list. You know, it's like I feel like I won't be able to truly rest. Remember that scene in Spirited Away when that river spirit, it has all the gunk and the bicycles stuck in it. And then they finally get the, the dirt, the stuff pulled out of it. And it turns into this wisp that just flies away. I feel like when we... When we finally get to 1.0, I'm just going to turn into a being of pure light and just <laughs> fly to space. Please don't. <laughs> but yeah, no. So, but uh, I mean, these sounds awesome, and uh, pretty much those are the questions that I have for you right now. So, first of all, I would really like to thank you for doing this interview. Thank you so much for taking the time, and we will be really looking forward to the colonies update when they land. Thanks a lot. I appreciate it.